Good morning, everyone. Please turn to hymn number 56. Hymn 56, When We All Get to Heaven, first, second, and last stanza. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. While we walk the pilgrim pathway, clouds will overspread the sky. But when traveling days are over, not a shadow, not a sigh. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see jesus we'll sing and shout the victory onward to the prize before us soon his beauty will behold soon the pearly gates will open we shall tread the streets of gold when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. All see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Great. So uh, let's have you turn to the book of Proverbs. <clears throat> okay, so um, let's have you turn to Proverbs 1. 1. Okay. Proverbs one one. And while we're turning to that, um, so what I have here is for those who want it. I'll give it to you afterwards. I have a list of um, verses from the New Testament. And eventually, when you do them, you will end up completing the entire New Testament. And uh, there's many ways to go about memorizing verses. One way is just randomly pick verses you like, which is a good thing. I think the answer is always pick verses you like. If you don't like the verse, you're not going to end up memorizing. Or you can, um, so unfortunately, if you only pick verses you like, you might end up memorizing most of your verses off from the book of Romans, and then it feels like you're not as diverse as you should be, right? So another way to do it is it's kind of creative. You memorize one verse out of each book of the New Testament to see if you can actually create the New Testament from your memory. And I, I would say this, that uh, it's a challenge and it's really fun. I know it sounds like, oh, yeah, memorizing verses is work. And in the beginning, it's work, but it becomes really fun after a while. I, I know it sounds weird that it becomes really fun, but it's true. And uh, 
So uh, something that I normally do is I have to walk a mile every day I have off. So I don't know how you guys exercise. I don't believe in paying money to go to the gym. <laughs> oh, and now you can't go to the gym anyway, so I don't believe in paying money um, to, to, to exercise. We got the most beautiful seashore to walk. I usually walk along Fort Funston. We got, it's like I walk the ocean or I walk uh, Stern Grove. Uh, God has created the most beautiful nature. However, and when it rains, I haven't done this. Only Melvin has, Melvin has actually um, been to uh, Stonestown Shopping Mall because, of, you know, since the pandemic. Has anyone been to Stonestown? You have? Is it is still open? Yeah, okay. So maybe I'll have to do it, but usually I have to do the mile walk. And then when it rains, yeah, I do Stonestown or Ceremony or uh, Tan Friend. You know, you can't. During the winter, you, it rains every day, right? So when it rains every day, you, you can't do Stonestown all the time. It gets really boring. And uh, so you do Ceremony and then you do uh, Tan Friend. Okay, and uh, here's something else I mentioned. Um, this is very interesting for those of you who are astronomers. Uh, I guess you guys know that uh, they have the, the Neowise comet out there. And usually comets come out in, uh, that's visible to the naked eye about once every 25 years, every quarter of a century. So unfortunately, I've been watching every night and it's always cloudy. So uh, it's going to be with us for several weeks. We've got to have one cloudless night, right? And uh, I, the only reason I mention is the last time there was a comet was about 25 years ago, the Hale-Bob comet. And for the Hale-Bob comet, interesting enough, we were buying our property back then. So we would pray in the parking lot during the, you know, the day and we'd pray during the night. And I remember coming into the parking lot and looking, oh, yeah, there's a hill bob comet. And uh, it's very rare for a comet to come this close to Earth and maybe another 25 years or maybe out of your lifetime, you'll never see another comet again. So for those of you who are interested in seeing the Neil Wise comet, um, basically the way you look for it is you look in the sky. <laughs> yeah, obviously. And you're looking at the south west, excuse me, northwest sky. So the northwest sky, and for those of you who are not astronomers, I'll show you how to do it. Okay, the northwest sky. So if you look in your direction, this is north, 19th Avenue going up toward Marina's north, and the beach is west. So you're there, okay? And I haven't done it yet but living in the sunset the sunset reservoir has a great view over the northwest sky and uh, and then you may say where in the northwest it's um how many in the audience have seen the big dipper okay good so only these two have seen the big dipper so there's a constellation called the big dipper okay so it looks like this okay so if you connect the lines right here. Hey, Sean, didn't you have to learn your constellations when you're in the Boy Scouts? Yeah, okay. So, so um, and you have a little star right here called the North Star. You take these two pointer stars right here, and this will always point you north if you ever get lost at night, okay? So you look for the Big Dipper. And there it is. So where is this star? So basically, for those of you who don't know much about astronomy, the sun passes over, the moon passes over, and it's not because they're moving, it's because the Earth rotates. This Big Dipper will move across the sky like that, okay? So it, it could be there or it could be on the tail, but excuse me, I got it wrong. It rotates around the North Star. The North Star never moves. All the constellations move around the North Star. So where's the comet? It's near the tail. They say it is three fifths of a, from the, so you hand out, you reach your hand out there 
and you measure one, two, three, and it's somewhere in this area right here. So the comet could be like that. And um, the comet, for those of you who don't know much about comets, the comet, it isn't, the comet tail always faces away from the sun. So as it leaves our planet, our solar system, it's gonna move backwards with the tail facing away from the sun. So I'm looking for it every day and every day it's cloudy. So that's something for you guys to do. It may not happen within your lifetime again. So um, recently it's near Mars, excuse me, near Mercury. So it's really near the sun. But now it's getting closer and closer to the Earth because the Earth has this big uh, circle. What makes you think that we happen to be on the right side of the circle and right side of the sun, but it happens to be close enough? And uh, so I'm going to look for that. And I thought you guys might look for it in the sky. And if you don't know anything about constellations north and west, somewhere in that. And it's near the bottom of this. Okay, so what does this tell you when it's near the bottom of this? This is pretty high in the sky because the North Star is always toward the north like there. So for those of you who are looking for it, you can find it. Okay, so today we're going to speak from the book of Proverbs. And let's read Proverbs 1, uh, verse 1 to 7. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, the king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to receive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, equity, to give subtlety to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto those wise counsel. To understand a proverb and the interpretation thereof, the words of the wise and their uh, dark sayings. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but the fool shall despise the wisdom and instruction. So let's bow for a word of prayer. Okay, dear God, we want to thank you that we can worship you today. And we just pray that we learn a lot about chapter one in the book of Proverbs. We want to thank you in Jesus' name, amen. So here's the first quiz question I have for you in the audience. The quiz question is, who wrote Proverbs? Okay. So I'll ask somebody in the back row, like Sammy, and according to verse number one, who wrote Proverbs? Solomon. Okay. So I just want to tell you something about Solomon and the book of Proverbs, the book of Ecclesiastes, and the book of Song of Solomon. Okay. The book of Psalms was written by King David, okay? And most of you guys may not know who wrote the various books, but one day when you start reading the whole Old Testament, you'll actually know who wrote these things. Proverbs could have been named the book of Solomon, okay? And, uh, but we didn't name it the book of Solomon, but right, verse number one, the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, the king of Israel. So, um, in, in theory, Solomon wrote three books, okay? Um, one actually bears his name, right? So I will ask Gibson, what, what's the book that actually has a name? Solomon. Yeah, Song of Solomon, okay? So, so we know two books. Proverbs was written by Solomon. Song of Solomon was written by Solomon. And Ecclesiastes was written by Solomon. And this is what they say about the three books in relationship. They say that when Solomon was a young man, he wrote Song of Solomon. So if you read Song of Solomon, yeah, it feels like something a young man would write. And then when Solomon was middle age, he wrote Proverbs. And then when Solomon became old, he wrote Ecclesiastes. And when you read Ecclesiastes, you will feel an old Solomon. So uh, get a chance to read all three of them. Know something about that. And uh, so let's go to uh, chap uh, verse number two. To know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding. So I just want to mention something. Um, this, is, um, this is our relationship to God, okay? Our relationship is 
God is the architect and we are the builders. So let me give you an example for those of you who don't know how things work in the world. The architect draws the plans and after uh, he creates the plans in his mind, he takes the plans and he gives it to the builder. And the builder tries to follow the plans exactly as the architect draws it. And in this case, God is our architect. He already has a plan for our life. We just don't know what it is. And then what we do is God gives us the plan. The plan is the Bible. So the only way we can build the house that God has intended for us is to actually read this. If and a builder builds something without the plans of the architect, he'll build it incorrectly, and it won't come close to what the architect wanted. In fact, the builder has no idea what the architect wants if he doesn't have the plans. Likewise, we have, a build, uh, we have an architect that's God, and God has given us these plans. So it's up to us to read these plans so we can create the great, the great building that God has for us for our life. But you know what? There are so many people who are ignorant of the word of God. I really would emphasize that according to this book, we need to, we need to get our wisdom and instruction from the, from the Lord. Verse number two, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding. So we need to perceive what God wants for us. We need to build according to what God wants. And whatever God wants, Whatever God plans for us is perfect, okay? It only becomes unperfect when we decide we don't want to go by the plans. That's why I don't want people to say, well, I didn't know that was in the Bible, okay? Uh, God gave it to us. We ought to read it. And, uh, you know, one of the problems is within our Christian society, I've never met so many babies. I mean, someone would say, oh, yeah, I've been worshiping God for 10 years. Well, have you read the Bible yet? No, you're, and then you're still a baby. Is there a reason why within the 10 years you haven't read the Bible? You've read everything else in the world. So it, it, it's amazing. There's Christians who never want to grow up. Okay, and They think, oh, yeah, I've been a Christian for 10 years. It means something. It means nothing if you haven't read this. So we read it, and God has instructed. In order for us to know the wisdom of God and the instruction of God, we need to read the word of God. Okay, Perceive the words. And God has given us the words. Um, so I, I do have this. If you've never read the New Testament, there's no excuse. Read the New Testament. Know it all. And then thereafter, if you haven't read the Old Testament, you have to read the Old Testament. You can't claim to be a mature Christian if you don't know this. Okay. And it's amazing how many Christians I talk to all the time that had, they have wild doctrines. And the reason they have wild doctrines is because they don't know this. And it's the reason it's wild is because Satan gives you the wild doctrine and people start listening to one another and then it, it cycles. It doesn't cycle unless you get it from the real author, the real architect. So if you haven't read the New Testament, please do it. If you haven't read the Old Testament, please do it. And uh, some people and if you want correct doctrine, you have to read this. So. There's one, um, one missionary, Radford, uh, we had to take him off the list. His doctrine was way off. We asked, him, we asked him, how does one get saved? And he said, he, he didn't have an answer. I said, well, pray in the salvation prayer according to the book of Romans chapter 10 is the way we do it. And the way we do it is this is what God said. It wasn't we made it up. And he says, oh, I don't believe in chapter 10. And once you don't believe in the Bible, then you have, you are in a cult. Okay, so the Bible is the foundation of what we believe. But that's not the shocking part. The shocking part is other people have no idea how one gets saved and they really don't care. Okay, we need to care about the doctrines that we believe. And uh, so um, a lot of us. We'll have an excuse why we haven't read the Bible. Our excuse is, oh, uh, I have no time for God. I'm too busy. I'm on the Internet all the time. Well, why don't you just not, not be on the Internet, get rid of it, and read something for real? I believe, um, <clears throat> you know, people say we live in the information age. It's amazing. 
We live in the information age, yet we don't know the ultimate information. We are illiterate when it comes to the Bible. There are people who are illiterate when it comes to prayer. There are people who are illiterate when it comes to faith. People who are illiterate spiritually. They, well, they are illiterate because they don't want to know God. You know, how can a person claim they're a Christian if they don't want to know the God who wrote this Bible? And the only way to know about the God is to read the Bible that he wrote. So it's amazing. We live in the information age and everybody thinks they're so educated. I got news for you. We are spiritually illiterate compared to the last generation that didn't have the internet. What did they do? They actually read the Bible. I would, um, you know, the composer Handel, who wrote Handel's Messiah, he wrote the Hallelujah Chorus. It's amazing how much Bible he knew. If, that, if the average person knew that much Bible back then, then we are shamefully not, we know nothing about the Bible. If you ever listen to Handel's Messiah, he will quote, I mean, the Hallelujah Chorus is from the book of Revelation, okay? And he will have something from the book of Isaiah, and he will have something from, like Melvin speaking, the book of Job, okay? The verse he has is, is beautiful. Um, I know that my Redeemer liveth and that he shall reign in the latter days upon the earth. He will have a quote from the book of Zechariah. I mean, most of you guys haven't read Zechariah, and he already knows the verse from Zechariah. It's about the prophecy of Jesus coming on a donkey. So if that is an example of people without technology, knowing how much a lot of the Bible, it's shameful that we have the technology and we don't know the Bible. So, you know, we have no excuse, okay? Now, the Amish people, um, they have decided not to use technology. And some of you may say they're very backwards, but I believe this. The reason they don't want to use technology is because they personally believe that technology will keep them from God. Well, you know what? Look at our society. Isn't technology keeping us away from God? They just focus on, you know, I, they don't even use electricity, okay? So they go to bed early. They use lamps. They read the Bible, and that's all they do. And you know what? I can't criticize them that for that because they are more spiritual than people today, okay? People they, they don't even read the Bible. I don't know what they do on the Internet all night, but it wasn't this, okay? You can... I'm not saying you don't go on the internet at all, but how about this? Doesn't this count? So <clears throat> they, they spend so little time with God as if God does not exist, okay? The average person who thinks they're a Christian spends zero time with God. Well, what kind of God do they have where you spend no time with God? So uh, let's go to verse number three. To receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, equity. So, you know what? You can't receive anything of God if you don't know what's in here. Okay? God has given it to us, but then if we decide not to accept the present, then we don't get it. So, it's important in verse number three that we receive the word of God. And... Uh, you can't know what God's plan is unless you read this. You don't know what God's promises are unless you read this. You don't know what kind of blessing God has for you unless you read this. You don't know what kind of power you can have from God unless you read this. You don't know how, what type of protection God has for us unless you read this. this. These things are of God. We want the promises of God. We want the blessings of God. We want the power of God. We want the protection of God. But you're not going to get it unless you read this. Malachi 3.10, okay, was one of the verses that I wrote down to memorize for the Old Testament. And it says something that you'll be su surprised, okay? So let's have you turn to Malachi 3.10. So, of course, no one reads the Minor Prophets. But Malachi 3.10 has a promise. And if you ever memorize that verse, you'll notice that God will give you the promise. If you don't know what the verse is, you'll never know what the promise is, and therefore you'll never get the gift. Malachi 3.10, it says, Bring all the tithes to the storehouse that there may be meat in my house, and prove me now herewith, said the Lord, uh, the Lord of hosts, 
if I will not open to you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be enough room to receive it. Now, how are you going to claim that promise unless you know that promise is in the Bible? Okay? It's amazing. If God wants to, he can pour out all the blessing, and we can't even accommodate all the blessings he has. And when would that happen? When we know this verse and we claim that promise. Here's another one, Jeremiah 33.3, okay, which is on the list, but I'm not giving you that list today. Jeremiah 33.3. So Isaiah, Jeremiah, so Isaiah is the big one, then Jeremiah 33, 3. Jeremiah 33, 3. What kind of other promises does God have? It says, call unto me and I will answer thee. God promises he'll answer. And show you great and mighty things which thou knowest not. That's another promise. But no, no, most Christians never claim that promise because they don't know the promise exists. And the reason they don't know the promise exists is because they don't read this. If you want great things from God, you need to quote his promises. Let's go back to Proverbs chapter 1. So to receive things, you got to know what God has to offer. Okay. So Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1, verse number 5. A wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsel. Okay? A man will hear and will increase learning. So every one of us as Christians should be increasing on how we serve God. We should increase on how much we spend time with God. We should increase on how much we read the, the Bible. We should increase the time that we have in prayer. We should increase the amount of power we get from God. Even Jesus, when he was growing up, every day in the Bible in the New Testament it says Jesus was increasing. I got a question for you. With the virus, are you increasing or are you decreasing? I believe that the majority of Christians who are not in church this morning are decreasing. Look at the last few months. Can you honestly say you are increasing? I believe that we cannot use the virus as an excuse to be decreasing. There is no middle ground. It isn't, oh, I'm, I'm neutral. I'm not increasing. I'm not de It's either you are increasing or you're decreasing. If you're increasing, you're in the will of God. If you're decreasing, you're in the will of Satan. You're doing exactly what he wants to do, which is nothing. Are you increasing? According to verse number five, a wise man will hear and he will increase. So um, something that I try to do, I'm not a fan of memorizing Bible verses because, you know, I don't even like memorizing poetry. I'm not into memorizing anything. And uh, most of you guys will use the excuse. I don't have time to read the Bible. I don't have time to memorize a verse. Well, here's my excuse. I'm too old to learn a verse. I'm an old man. Old men, old men don't learn new things. So I said, okay, maybe I should try the New Testament. Maybe one day they've taken away the law. You know, the government wants to take away our ability to worship God. And one day the government will take away the Bible. The only thing they can't take away is what I have memorized right here. So I said, maybe it is good that I memorize the New Testament. And, you know, Melvin is my inspiration. He's able to memorize everything in the New Testament, every uh, one per book in the Old Testament. If Melvin can do it, maybe I can, okay? It isn't God gave all the gifts to Melvin. God gave all the gifts to all of us, but we don't want to accept the gift. So I said, okay, I don't have the gift of memorizing verses. And, by the way, Melvin can memorize everyone's phone number, everyone's address. I don't have that gift either, okay? Uh, but we all got different gifts. But I was wondering, could I have memorized verses? Maybe, you know, it's not God's desire that he gives all the gifts to Melvin. He gives the gifts to everybody. Maybe I can memorize the verse even though I'm over the hill. So I said, okay, I will try one verse and see how hard it is. Because, you know, the older you get, you know, when I was in my 20s at 
the UC Medical Center, I can memorize volumes and stuff. Now I'm over the hill, you know, it's different. Wait till you guys get over the hill. So I said, okay, I'll memorize the first verse, see how hard it is. So the first verse I had was Jude, Jude verse 21. Let's have you turn to Jude 21. Jude 21. And most of you guys would say, this is an easy verse. It wasn't. Jude 21. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. So I said, okay, I'm going to try to memorize this verse. You know what? One day later, I st still couldn't remember the word keep. I just couldn't get the first word, keep. And then after a while, I got the keep. And still, uh, I couldn't get the word looking. Okay, keep yourselves something. Keep yourselves, what was it? Uh, in the mercy of God? Is, that, is it the mercy of God? Oh, in the love of God. See, so it was so hard. It, it took me a long time. A whole week, you know, that proves that you're over the hill. It takes you one week to memorize this verse. How about you guys? You have young minds. You can do it faster than me, right? Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto salvation, right? Is that salvation? No, it's eternal life. So then what's amazing is this. The next verse got easier. And the next verse got easier. And the next verse got easier. I, it's like, wow, what, what happened? What happens is this. This is what I believe with all of you. If you're going to say to God, oh, God, I'm going to actually read the new, all the books of the New Testament or all the books of the Old Testament, God will make, Satan will make it so hard, you don't want to read it no more. Okay? The first verse was so hard. He says, oh, yeah, you don't want to, you know, you, you quit, right? So I, I finally got it. And the next one was easier and easier. You know why? Because when it's your turn to memorize a verse, Satan's going to make sure it's super hard and you'll never do it again. He won't tell you the honest truth. The next one gets easier because he's not sitting on you anymore. Okay, so, uh, so uh, let's turn back to first uh, Proverbs 1. There. Proverbs 1. Okay, here we go. So, verse number 5. Are you increasing or are you de decreasing in your service for God? I believe that Satan has an excuse. It was too hard to memorize the first verse, so let's quit. And, you know, eventually I finished the New Testament. And I said, hey, you know what? I'm... I'm ready for the ultimate, the Old Testament. So what you do is you read the Old Testament, you pick your favorite verse. Okay, if it's not your favorite verse, you're not going to memorize it. And you know, and when do I memorize this? Okay, this is when I memorize it. Remember, I said I have to walk one mile every day. So what do you think goes? It's either I look, oh, what a beautiful beach for you know one mile, or or do I? If it's a really cold day, it's like, oh, yeah, maybe I'll do my verses and I won't remember how cold it is today or how windy it or, or the sand and skinning in my eyes and nose or whatever. So uh, that's a great time. A lot of you guys are exercising. That's a good time to do your verse. So we all have excuses. Uh, and then, you know what? Um, I, th I think this. If you're not increasing, you're decreasing. And people who are decreasing have an excuse. Everyone has an excuse. If you think hard enough, there's... And, and who do you think gives you the excuses? It wasn't God. Okay? God didn't say, well, you know what? You're over the hill. You can't memorize a verse. It was Satan that said it. But I believe people use the excuse for not worshiping God on Sunday morning in church because of the virus. Okay? And after a while, you start believing your own excuse. And the excuse is not even true, okay? So if you are decreasing, you're not growing in God, and you say, I have an excuse. The virus is keeping me from increasing. Nonsense. We got an almighty God that can protect us. What kind of God do you have, okay? Um, so I don't want anyone to start repeating their own lies and actually believe in it or Satan's lie. And, believe, and you know, Satan's lies, the virus is going to keep you from worshiping. We ought to all worship God. We all need to increase our service in worshiping God. 
Let's go to verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise the wisdom and instruction. Okay, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. So when I went to UC Berkeley, I had to take an exam to see what kind of English level I qualified for. And what I did, uh, I don't remember the topic that we had to write our essay, but I did something that no one, no one I believe did because they're going to UC Berkeley. I quoted from the Bible. Okay? And the quote is, if you quote from the Bible, maybe they don't like you because you're a Christian, therefore you're not going to get into UC. I don't care. I have an almighty God, and I represent the almighty God, and I don't care if I don't make it to the UC because God will get me to where I need to go. Okay? If I want to be a dentist and God wants me to be a dentist, I can quote the Bible. Either God's going to allow me to go there or not. I don't need UC. I just need God. I quoted the Bible. Of course, I quoted it correctly. I wrote down on my essay, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Okay? And, of course, <laughs> People from UC wouldn't know whether or not I'm quoting it correctly or not. And, uh, and I passed, okay? I didn't care whether or not I passed. I care whether or not I represented God. I passed, and I did very well, and then I rejected UC. It's like, I don't want to go to your school anyway. But uh, I can be a dentist without UC. But um, that's because I have a great God, and my great God will give me the great opportunity. Do you fear God more than school? Do you fear God more than the virus? Do you fear God more than your job? I believe that verse number seven, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, and but fools would despise the wisdom and instruction. Fools would despise this. So, <clears throat> so I don't care if, you know, <clears throat> The demons will always make you believe something else. That's why you need to know this, okay? Otherwise, you start believing in what the demons, and the demons always give you a fear. And, um, <clears throat> and if something goes wrong, you always have God to rely on. But uh, one last verse, and I'm done. Deuteronomy 4.39. Deuteronomy 4.39. <clears throat> So, for those of you who don't know what the word Deuteronomy means, does anyone in the audience know what the word Deuteronomy means? Okay, why, why do we have, okay, besides Melvin, why do we have such a weird word Deuteronomy? Okay, so I'll tell you what Deuteronomy means, okay? So, if you are a crime fighter, a super, super fan of crime fighters, we use the word dynamic duel, okay? So, what is dynamic duel mean so as ivy okay batman and robin are the dynamic duel so what does that mean ivy dynamic duel oh okay that's close does anyone know what the dynamic garson do you know what the dynamic duel means yeah two of them okay dynamic duel two so you notice the word dynamic duel duel and deuteronomy means two to what? It's the second time, the, ten, the second law, okay? Anami means law, dudo means two, the second law. The second, so you will read, when you read this, you'll read the Ten Commandments again, okay? So Moses wrote most of it in Exodus, but he writes it again in Deuteronomy in more detail. So it means the second law. So we should just call this the second law, but since no one knows what Deuteronomy means, and since no one knows when, you know, the crime fight, since no one watches Batman and Robin, maybe they don't know what this means. So let's have you turn to Deuteronomy 4.39. Deuteronomy 4.39. And it says this. Know therefore this day, and consider it in thine heart, that the Lord, he is God of heaven above, and he is uh, God upon the earth beneath, and there is no one else, okay? Thou shalt keep, therefore, his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee this day, that it may go well with thee and with thy children after thee, and that thou mayest prolong thy days upon earth, which the Lord thy God giveth thee forever, okay? Verse 39 
Know ye therefore this day and consider it in thine heart that the Lord, he is God in heaven and upon the earth and there is no other God. What is it trying to say? It says, we must understand how great our God is. Verse number 39. Know ye there, therefore this day that the Lord, he is God in heaven and on earth. We have truly a great God. What kind of God do you have? Do you have a great God? We must worship our great God every Sunday. Okay. Do you have a big God, a great God, a powerful God? It's almost as we have two different, many Christians, they seem to be worshiping a different God than from the God I know. The God I know is great. The God I know is powerful. The God I know can protect us. The God I know is a creator. The God I know can work miracles. And the other Christians have another God. The virus comes, their God is small. Their God is powerless. Their God does nothing. Their God is passive. They don't even recognize. They don't even spend time with their small God. We spend time with the big God. What kind of God do you have? Let's go on. Verse 40. Thou shalt keep, therefore, God's statures and keep God's commandments, which I command thee this day, that it will go well with thee, with your children, and it will prolong thy days. When we worship God, we are keeping the commandment. It says, therefore, keep therefore his statures and the commandments. And we all know the commandment that we should worship God every Sunday in church. However, there are some of you guys with a small God. I mean, if you truly understand how big God is, you'd be worshiping God in church. But some of you guys have the small God. My small God can't protect me. My small God is neutral. You know what? I got a big, big God. My big God has protected everybody in this church. I don't know anyone in this church that has the virus. In fact, I don't know anyone that has the virus. Okay. I don't know anyone who has died. Okay. But then some of you guys are listening to the other Satan that's telling you, oh, you have an excuse not to worship God. You know what? I didn't read in the Bible that says there is an excuse not to worship God. We ought to be worshiping God because we have a great God, a big God. You guys have a small God that cannot protect you from the virus. I got a big God that can protect me. But big God that created me, the big God that cares about me, the big God that has miracles. So, you know what? A lot of Christians will say, oh, I will worship at home. Okay, you know what? God never said worship at home. That is not the word of God. But because you don't know the word of God, because you don't read the word of God, you don't know the word of God. You can't say, oh, I'm going to worship God at, my, at home. You know what happens? Most people who say that end up not worshiping God at all. Most people who practice that, their kids will say, oh, my parents worship at home. I will worship at home. I go to college, and they don't end up worshiping God. So the reason we worship God is because we have a great God. We have a big God. And we do it exactly the way the Bible says it, not the way you think it ought to be. There is no virus that can keep me between me and God. Either I have a God that can protect me, or I have a small God that cannot protect me. So <clears throat> let me go on. What happens if we worship God exactly the way he says it in the Bible? Verse 40. Thou shalt keep, therefore, his statures and his commandments. If we do it exactly the way God does it, says it, it says this, that it may go well with thee. God will make you prosper. You will do well. Number, that's the first promise from who? From God, the big God that you're ignoring from the Bible. What's the second promise from our big God? Number two, you do it exactly the way God says it. And with thy children after thee, God will bless your kids. Your kids will follow God. Your kids will worship God. Your kids want to learn the Bible. What's the third thing? The third promise? 
Either you believe in God's promise or you don't. If you do it exactly the way God says it, the third promise is this, that you will live longer, prolong your days. Okay? So this, what can I say? This is what God says. Don't listen to the devil who has the fear. I believe there's a demon called the, the fear of the coronavirus. You, believe, you listen more to the fear than to this. We need to listen to the big God and not to the small God. Okay, so we need to be all worshiping, focusing on verse number 39. Know this today, that the Lord, he is God in heaven, and he is the God on earth, and he's the creator, and he's the protector, and he's the one that blesses us. Because we need to understand who our God is. And once we fear God, exactly like it says, then we begin to understand what God has for us. And we need to read this to keep the promises. So let's bow for a word of prayer. Dear God, the coronavirus is our excuse not to worship God. There is no excuse under the sun that sh should ever keep us from worshiping God. If we have, and if we do it exactly the way you say it, God, we understand you will give us these three blessings. Some of us haven't been blessed. Some of us haven't been doing it the way God says it. We need to understand, say, God, we will worship you because we have a big God. We finally understand how big our God is. Our God is greater than any disease. Our God can actually protect us. And he has protected us so far. And we want to thank you for protecting us. And we want to thank you for blessing us. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, one last thing. For those of you who want the challenge, I have the New Testament here. And... Uh, uh, I'll have it on the piano. If you want it, you can at least take a look. And these are really good verses. Uh, I pick from my attitude the best verses in the New Testament if you want to do the entire New Testament one verse. Okay. Among all this other junk here. Okay. The last song. Uh, Please turn your hymn books to hymn number 167. Hymn 167, All Hail the Power, first, second, and last. Jesus name, let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Ye chosen seed of Israel's race, ye ransomed from the fall. Hail him who saves you by his grace, and crown him Lord of all. Hail him who saves you by his grace, and crown him Lord of all. Oh, that with yonder sacred throng we at his feet may fall. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. All right, that'll do it for this week. Let's close in a word of prayer. Okay, Heavenly Father, thank you. We're going to meet once again this Sunday. I pray that you would bring us back safely next Sunday to worship you again uh, this coming week. And just be with all of us that we would continue, as Nathan said, to try to read our Bible, do what we can to follow you and serve you, as it says in the Word of God. So we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so that'll do it. God bless you. Have a good week, and we'll see you next week.
Anything else? Anything that you want to end this first? The broadcast first?